Hi, welcome everybody. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, we see some participants joining us. Feel free to use the chat to let us know who you are and where you're calling from. Good afternoon to those of you who are just joining our webinar. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. Feel free to say hello to us by using the chat. Let us know your name and who you work for. See our friend Dave Jones. Hi, Dave. Stephanie from Minnesota Power, welcome. We have a lot of energy companies in the house. Dominion Energy, First Energy, welcome. We have the American Red Cross. Hey, Bob Crow, our friend from Amerisource Bergen. I don't know how you have time to dial in for this today. All right, hey, Lindsay. Utah Division of Emergency Management. Hey, welcome guys. We'll just get started in a few seconds. Welcome to Alex from the National Capital Region Watch Desk. And Joe from the Capital Region Water. Capital Region Water. All right, welcome. All right. I have that it's about a minute after four. So let's go ahead and get started. Hopefully a, a few more participants will join us. We have a good gang on the line. So I wanted to welcome you to the All Hazards Consortium Business Resiliency Virtual Discussion Series. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about using GIS for, for your situational awareness needs. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm Laura Johnson. I'm the Director of Conferences and Events for All Hazards Consortium. Just a few administrative remarks before we get started. Uh, we are recording this uh, webinar, so we will make it available to you post-event for you to share uh, with your colleagues and peers. Um, you may have noticed you're all muted upon entry. Uh, feel free to use the chat or the Q&A function to send us a comment or a question. We have reserved time for the end of this webinar today to, to get to those. So uh, we'd love to hear from you, um, even if it's just to say hello. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, our executive director, Tom Moran. Tom? Hi, uh, Laura. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're good. So welcome, everybody. Um, I This is one of those topics that affects everyone, whether we know it or not, right? I am, I am the last person that understands GIS, and I've known Chris... For, for many years, Chris and I Chris go, and I go back to when he was at Virginia, so I'm really glad he's on board uh, to help us kind of work through this. Carrie Trapazzo is also with us. She is a really, really good thinking strategy kind of person when it comes to this. But as an operations person, this is a big one because we're trying to help keep an operational perspective on this technical topic and really make capability happen. So we're very, very excited to have you guys on this one. We're going to do a training in the spring, deep dive on this. We've got a work group that's been working on it as part of the SICE. You see on your screen, what is the SICE? SICE was started by the private sector. It's a framework, legal framework, that provides people security, privacy, process, technology, and solutions, so forth. Uh, and it's a framework to share information sector to sector or sector to government. Everyone's vetted. All the data is ranked based on confidential ranking developed by the SICE work group. Amazing framework. So we are holding today's conference, or today's webinar, if you will, uh, to zero in on one of the pieces the GIS committee has been working on is how do we help operational people and GIS people come together quickly, understand what each other are asking for and come out with a product in 10 minutes, right? And this, this is something we've been working on this for three years. So this, you're gonna get a tip of the iceberg and a deep dive in the spring. So if you'd like to register for the SICE, it's free. Uh, it's a way of us vetting people as they come into the community. It's at SiceUSA.org. 
uh, and we're really glad to get into this content. Uh, this is kind of just the tip of the iceberg. So I'm really glad you all are with us and uh, stick around afterwards. We'll do a little Q&A and that'll, that'll open up some questions, I'm sure. So Laura, back to you. Hey, thanks so much, Tom. As Tom mentioned, today's speakers are Chris McIntosh. Chris is the CEO of Bent Ear Solutions, and he's the co-chair of the SICE that Tom just mentioned, GIS Working Group. Um, and he is joined by Carrie Trapasso in his office. She is the GIS manager. So uh, this, this uh, event is a little bit different than the virtual discussions that we have in the past. Instead of giving them a list of questions and serving as a panel, uh, we are more um, going to pass the screen over to Chris and Carrie um, and have them get started. So with that, I'm going to stop my screen share and pass it over to you guys. Thanks, Laura. Can, uh, can you guys see my screen? Okay, um, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and I've got a few slides uh, that we're gonna go through real fast here. And then um, we're gonna turn it over to Carrie where she's gonna actually walk you through the, the GIS portion of this live. So uh, send positive vibes that all the technology works uh, as it should. So what is the problem um, that's, that we're trying to overcome here with situational awareness? And that is, when you're in the middle of a crisis, you need to make fast decisions. That means you need to gain situational awareness quickly on how bad is bad, what's happening, and what do you do need to do to respond. Uh, you need not just data, but you need that data organized into actionable information really quickly. We're in an environment now where there's no shortage of data. As a matter of fact, you're overwhelmed with data. <laughs> so how do you take that data massive amounts of data and turn it into something that you can make a decision on uh, in the middle of a crisis or how to use that data to um, improve your planning. Uh, at the same time, you're presented with many, many different options technology-wise. There's different vendors, there's different trade craft, there's different services. How do you sort it all out and, turn, and, and create a situational awareness program that allows you to get the right information in the right way at the right time? Um, and it's not all about the technology. First thing is, a, this, and many of you know this, emergency management cycle. You have different needs depending on what phase of the cycle that you're in. If you're in a blue sky day, you need general awareness. You need to understand what your threats and vulnerabilities are that you can plan against. You need to establish your goals. Um, if you're in a prevention phase, and these all happen simultaneously, most of you know that. Uh, if you're in a prevention phase, you, what am I doing to mitigate risk? What am I doing? To, I've identified that I have flood hazards. What am I doing to mitigate those hazards? And how do I measure uh, the success of those efforts, for example? Um, planning and your preparation phase, does my plan work? What's my evacuation plan? Um, does my evacuation plan work if there's two incidents going on simultaneously? I was during my time in emergency management, I was uh, I was an operations chief and I was put in the unenviable position of realizing that the two incidents that I had going on at the same time, the, uh, the planned response to them canceled each other out. That's not a good thing to find out in the middle of a crisis. So being able to visualize those plans and, and, and uh, game plan uh, in different scenarios. And then obviously response, what's happening? How bad is it? Where is it happening? Who's impacted? What do I need to do to... Uh, to respond, and then recovery. Uh, how am I uh, getting my my jurisdiction, my citizens, my organization back up and running uh, as quickly as possible? And with with situational awareness, they're all different uh, depending on which phase of this cycle that you're in. However, the data underlying is often the same. So, how do you do that? How do you create these tools that you can use across the entire emergency management cycle? Well, it's a process. And this is the part that a lot of people don't like to hear is that the process does not start with the technology. And many of us see a dashboard, see something shiny somewhere, and we want to say, I want that. But the actual the process begins with a conversation, a conversation with the decision makers to understand what are the user needs? What do you need to know? What are the questions you need answered? And this is key because the technology if it doesn't answer a question that you need answered, then it's just pretty wallpaper. And we see too much of that in too many operation centers around the country. 
So do you need program, does the, does the technology to answer program management questions, things like grant programs, mitigation programs, recovery programs, do you need actual situational awareness? And then what is the question you need to answer? For example, if a large truck full of chlorine flips over on the interstate, do you care? The answer is you don't know. However, if that large truck full of chlorine flips over in a, on the interstate two miles upwind from a school, do you care? Probably you do. That's context, that's answering a very specific question and that's a question that GIS can answer. Um, other things like, do you have access to the data and all of that? Uh, and do you have standard operating procedures that say that you're going to do things uh, that you have not aligned to your technology? So starting working through all of this is where you have to start and that's real work. It takes time, it takes commitment and it takes energy, but without that, the technology cannot be successful. So given that, we're gonna assume that we've done that and we're going to assume that we have a series of weather questions that we need to answer. And now Carrie is gonna show you um, that it is actually possible to take that and very quickly, and this is for uh, largely for the non-GIS folks on the call to see how those things can be trans transformed into actionable information pretty quickly with resources that most of you already have. So Carrie, over to you. All right, thanks, Chris. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Yes. All right, sounds good. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm not going to get super technical, um, but I'm going to show you on the previous slide, Chris was talking about some of the sources and how that can be turned into actionable information. So as most of you probably know, there is data everywhere and they come in many sources. What I'm going to show you here is how to simply create a map in ArcGIS Online, which is a web map. And I'm going to turn it into a dashboard. Um, I'm going to show just a few things in the dashboard, talk about it a little bit and show you the end result. So let me dig right in. So I'm just in ArcGIS Online. I'm gonna come in here and go to Map, All right? <clears throat> so I have a few things in here already, um, but I wanna show you um, if I come in here and search for layers and type in the word weather. Notice nothing came up, all right? So the reason being, you have your content. So that's everything that I own within ArcGIS Online. But there's a whole other additional set of data that I can tap into. So if I come in here to, for example, what's called the Living Atlas. So I think there's over 40,000 layers within Esri's Living Atlas. And as you can see, the word weather has returned all of this information. So if I just scroll kind of slowly down through, you can see all of the weather, just what returned on the word weather. And if I wanted to add any of these, I can click, simply click the plus sign. So scrolling down through, here's all the tropical weather, the hurricanes. So let's say if I wanna add the active hurricanes, um, notice the tracks came in. So that's how I've added a majority of the data um, that you see. But there are other ways that I can add data too. Um, for example, if I come in here again and I'm going to search for layers, I'm going to say I want to look for lightning. So I'm going to look for emulated lightning. Again, nothing's going to return because it's out there in some other place. So in this case, it's in ArcGIS Online. So half the battle is knowing where to look. Um, so again, ArcGIS Online and the Living Atlas. So ArcGIS Online is everything that's shared publicly. The Living Atlas is put out by Esri and maintained by Esri. So here again is emulated lightning. I would simply click the plus sign to add this to my map. <clears throat> there are again many other places I can put um, or add data in here. I'm going to add one more source of data. So I'm actually going to come out here to the National Weather Service. So a lot of this data is in the Living Atlas already, but I want to make you aware um, all of this weather data is out on weather.gov slash GIS slash web services. Um, so if I come in here, uh, they give you the link directly to all of their data. So the radar that you saw in my map just a minute ago, if I come in here and click radar, again, this looks very technical and scary, but all you need to do is copy this URL, come on over here, go add, because I'm going to add data, and I'm going to say, hey, I want to add this layer from the web. And I simply paste this URL right here, 
and I add the layer. So I've just added a whole bunch of data from several different sources. There was data in here already. Um, I had some data in here just because my connection today has been a little um, iffy. I have a lot of weather going on outside my window. So I'm, in, I'm up in here um, in Pennsylvania. Um, so I'm getting some of what you can see here with all of the, uh, the storm. So this is the remnants of, of Ada moving through. So now what do I do with this information? All right, what does this information mean, right? So if I come in here, I'm gonna just save it and I'm gonna share. So I'm not sharing it to anybody yet, but what I wanna do is create a web app, all right? So I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna say, I wanna create a dashboard, all right? So I'm gonna just come in here and say demo, give it a tag. Um, this is gonna be demo weather board and I'm gonna click done. And what this is gonna do, it's automatically gonna put this web map into a dashboard for me. So once it's here, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the things that you can do in here. Um, so up here is a plus sign. And if I click on that plus sign, here are all the different things that I can add to this dashboard. So by default, the map was added. You don't have to start with the map, but I did today. So I could add a map separately or I could add multiple maps. There's a header, a side panel, your simple legend. So that tells you what's in the map. Serial chart, so that's your pie chart, I'm sorry, your um, bar charts, your line charts. You also have a pie chart. Indicators, which is what I'm gonna show here in just a couple minutes. A gauge, so that tells you how much um, of something is against a total. You have lists, so if you um, want to list out a whole bunch of things from your data, you can do that. Next one here is details. Um, so the details gives you the ability to put um, links and photos and very detailed information about your um, data. Rich text is simply just something that you type in. And then embedded content is you can actually put other websites um, right in this dashboard. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna add one or two indicators and then I'm gonna show you um, what this could look like with just a few more minutes, but I don't wanna take up a ton of time here. Um, so if I come in here, I want to add, let's see, I'm going to add a gauge and I want the observe river stage. All right, there's a lot of rain going on right now. There's a lot of flooding. So what I want to say is, all right, what this number is here, this is the overall number of gauges. So how do I make this into something that means something to me? I want to look at just the gauges with a major flood stage or higher. So I'm going to come in here and filter that information. So if I come in here, I just click status, choose equal, and here are all of my different status available. I'm gonna choose major. So I have six gauges right now in major flood stage. Now, I can also set a reference type. So if I wanna say I want a reference type of one, and I'll show you why that's important in just a second. Um, I'm gonna work with the indicator, the actual, what this means and what I'm looking at right now. So if I come in here, I'm gonna do conditional formatting. So what you see here is style for the value at or above reference, style for the value below the reference, all right? I don't want this one to be here. That's simply my reference. So I'm gonna get rid of that. Um, again, I'm gonna get rid of this as well, all right? And there's lots of different things I can do. I can actually add text here. So gauge in major flood stage. Um, I can change the colors of this. So if I wanted, you know, different colors, I can make different colors. I can change the sizing. So I've got a lot of different um, ability to do things here. So you can also put this title in at a different spot. So if you don't want it to set on the high and low, you can come in here to general and add a title right here. <clears throat> So I'm just gonna come in here, give it a little bit of formatting. All right, and I'm gonna click done. All right, so now I've got an indicator of gauge in major flood stage and I have six, all right? A couple of things at this point. So I can come up here and change my theme to dark. Why would I wanna do that? So if you've got this up on a big video wall, like in your EOC or anything going on, um, you can 
uh, excuse me, um, if you've got this up on your major wall, like in your EOC, it's black. And so why is that important? It's because if you have fluorescent lights in your EOC, um, it's going to affect how it visually comes across if the background is white. So if the background is this way, it's gonna make it really hard to read. So you can make it into a dark theme. You can also come in here and um, work with the colors. So again, change, change the text, change the information. The other thing I'm gonna show here is another indicator. So I'm just gonna add another indicator. <clears throat> Let's see. <clears throat> Let's do Let's do flash flood warnings. All right, so we've got eight right now. So again, I'm just gonna come in here. I'm gonna give this the title of flash flood warning. <clears throat> I'm gonna work with the text just a little bit. So again, just bear with me for a few more minutes. I'm not gonna dig too deep into this, but I do wanna show you this to you. <clears throat> And I'm gonna click done. Now, one thing here, you can click, pick this up and move it so I can come here and stack it. Notice there's a line in between my indicators. Um, I can also pick this up, hit the shift key, and now there's not a line in the indicator, all right? So I'm not gonna go through setting all of this stuff up, but I do have one that is set up. And so with a little bit longer working with the indicators and the map and all of the information in here, you can have something that looks like what we're seeing on the screen right now. So a couple of things to point out here. Um, if you have um, a threshold that you wanna meet, you can turn the backgrounds different colors. So for example, um, if, I want, if I have one rip current, I'm gonna turn this red because this is super important to me that I understand that there's a rip current. But maybe I don't care so much about flash flood warnings, probably not the case, but again, just to show the point, you can change the colors or not. You can also have lists. So down in here are the different lists. Um, so I mentioned um, in this case, this is flood warnings and I can come over here to the list and see the full list. Um, similar, I have observed gauges. So here are my gauges in major flood stage. If I click on one of these, the map automatically zooms to that location. I can actually turn them on if I choose to you can see the gauge right here. So I'm actually gonna turn them back off and I'm gonna select again and it's gonna zoom back out to the full extent. Now notice when I zoom and pan around here, the numbers around the outside are changing. Um, all of these are set based on my extent of my map. Um, so for example, if I zoom in here, um, I can click on this, get more information. So again, this is um, just a real quick example to show you how a simple map that we started with um, in my previous screen can turn into actionable information and situational awareness. We did weather just to show you, but take weather and transform it into any information that you would need such as transportation or um, incidents coming out of your system of record or pretty much anything that you can think of um, you can you know, put into something like this to give you that situational awareness. With that, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna turn it back over to Chris and uh, we are gonna show you some more examples um, of dashboards and applications that can really showcase and help your informational um, awareness in your, in your um, organizations. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, and that's, that's an example of just how um, using the off-the-shelf tools available to most of you uh, who already have invested in the Esri platform, you can build a, an information product, in that case, a dashboard, uh, pretty quickly. Um, so what Carrie did is she walked you through the sources that were available, and she used WebGIS sources, uh, but you, those sources can also be your crisis management system, spreadsheets, sensors, there's your flood gauges, drones, uh, other departmental internal information, and you can bring it all together into that web map that she built, pulling all those sources into, change the way that it looked, the colors, the, the symbology. Um, then she took that web map and put it into an app, in that case, a dashboard. Um, but there's other apps. I think there's in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 apps that are available to you. And 
one thing that's really important about the apps is this this term out there of common operating picture um, is kind of um, uh, becoming a legacy term because what she built could be work work very well on the big screen in your operation center. However, you may also want something that you carry with you on your iPad that allows you to ask questions and has little widgets and tools where you can dive into the information a little more quickly using the same web map, the same content, but you would have a different tool uh, for your individual use. We call it a user-defined operating picture or a mission-focused application. And then you could have a different one designed for use on your phone um, that if changes itself to the form factor of the device. So, so that if you're uh, a, a decision maker and you need instant information um, on your phone, then we, you may wanna build yourself one of those applications that works better on, on a phone than on the big board. So this common operating picture term is, is kind of going away because the technologies have moved so far that allows for that level of customization. The, uh, the most frustrating thing that I do, when that Carrie and I do often is when we see people who are spending large amounts of money on software and have the tools to answer these questions, and they just don't know what they uh, what what they own. Um, it's a big part of the problem with the the software as a service world, because when you do that, um, you you're you have, you're given this big platform with your software as a service subscription, but nobody walks you through all the little pieces of that. Uh, so. For example, in the Esri environment, there's now like nine different mobile applications from field data collection, yet I still see people building custom applications for it. There's, as I mentioned, 50, 60 different visualization tools or solutions uh, that are available to, available to you off the shelf. Just in the web apps, there's, I think, in the neighborhood of 70 widgets that you have available to you uh, to answer various questions. So. Um, if I had a nickel for every time I told somebody you already own that when they were looking to solve a problem, uh, I would have retired a long time ago. There's a lot of capability in there um, that uh, you might or may not be aware of. Um, and the last thing in this is the sustainment column over here. What, we, what you just saw Carrie build is great and it's useful, but too often folks stop there. And if you don't actually take that tool and use it to update your standard operating procedures, then all you have is a, um, is a uh, pretty thing on the wall. Um, so the, um, the reality is you need to rewrite your operational SOPs to use that tool. So that hurricane dashboard that you just saw should be in your response SOP saying, if we have a hurricane, you are going to, you being the operator, going to pull this tool up and this is how you use it to make decisions. It needs to be in the thou shalt. Otherwise we have, you have too many applications running around. They may or may not be supported. People may or may not know how to use them. Uh, they may or may not be trained on them. And this is the more time than not the case of the, the state of these type of situational awareness programs. So it's absolutely critical that you update the SOPs. It's also absolutely critical that you develop display plans. Display plans are how you can configure all those beautiful screens in your operation centers when you activate it for, in this case, a hurricane. So, um, that needs to be standardized. So it means on my big half a million dollar video wall, I'm going to put that dashboard in the top right corner. I'm going to put the weather channel in the top bottom, bottom left corner, whatever that is, but it's standardized so that when your people come in and they're activated or when your executives come in, or if you're with a state, the governor, or if you're with a, pro, a company, the CEO comes in, that's consistent. They know what they're looking at and know what to expect. It also ensures that those things like what Carrie just built are maintained because they're expected to work. So if they're expected to work, then they need to be maintained, make sure that those data feeds don't break. The National Weather Service may change the link, may change the content what's in that data. 
Uh, and the, 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 time, the, the worst time to catch that change is when you're activated. So a display plan provides a programmatic kind of flag in the ground that says, we are going to make sure that these critical things work, that we're trained on them, that they're consistent and that they're maintained by my GIS team, which leads to training. If you don't train on it, then you don't know how to use it. Um, and I'm not just talking about once in a great while training. I'm talking about periodic training, onboarding training, preseason training. So example, are you training up on the, your hurricane dashboards as you roll into hurricane season? Um, are you training on winter storm dashboards around this time of year when, when winter storms are beginning to uh, be on the radar? Um, so training is critical because these are complex tools. They have immense capability and too often that capability is not being harnessed because we're not doing these non-technical things. Um, and finally, feedback. And this is your after action review process, your lessons learned process, um, having a working group to, that makes sure that these things are actually answering the questions that were identified in the user needs uh, area. Are the, do they work for you? Do the simple things like the look and feel, uh, is the data being presented? Are the, is the context that's being presented working? Um, all of those things are critical um, to making sure that you have a viable program. Otherwise you just have a bunch of technology, uh, as we sometimes say, a solution looking for a problem. So going through all these steps, uh, Carrie walked you through the technical part is actually the easy part. The walking through the, the non-technical steps and being able to have a conversation as an operator with your GIS people and being able to kind of communicate with each other on that level is what this is all about and what it really hinges on. Um, hey Chris, let me, Chris, let me interject something real quick for those sure. that may not know. There's humans involved here. And when you have that, you have cultures, you have vocabulary, you've got humor, you've got all these things that keep people apart. And so in, in, in our collective world within the consortium, we have this all the time. Every time there's a disaster of any kind, we have to get 30 states, 100 companies, federal government, state agencies, all to kind of see the same thing. So Chris and Carrie Hicksham Duke started the SICE GIS committee, I think it was January, 2019. I put it in the chat. And we brought together 11 companies and six states. Remember that first call? It was awkward, okay? But we let, we facilitated that discussion because the people had to understand the common North Star, the common objective. And it was very simple. We wanna solve operational problems faster. And we realized right then, what Chris said is true. We use this graphic right here that you're looking at as a way to say, okay, GIS folks, you're on the left, towards the left, you know, operational decision makers, you're kind of towards the right, the, the you know, the, the apps and tools and, and how do we solve this faster? And it took us six months of Friday calls to kind of get unity. And since that time, I don't know how many products have been produced because now everybody understands their role and the, the net of the whole thing is we got to make decisions faster. So I can't underscore enough what Chris said about the process of working the issue and always having that clear North Star what are we trying to accomplish? And I think that effort has shown up in a major utility, took all this stuff, and now has our whole ops center utilizing this, right? It's pretty interesting how that's worked. But uh, again, if there's people involved, the technology is easy. <laughs> if there's people involved, that's where it takes the time, right? Because you have to get agreement. You have to get agreement, so great. What's, what's fascinating, and thank you for that, Tom, is, is uh, we have a lot of folks on here who have to make important decisions. And if you just stop for a second, if you're one of those people and say and ask when the phone rings at two o'clock in the morning, because it always seems to happen at two o'clock in the morning or a Sunday, um, and you're told something went boom or something went splash or whatever, every one of you probably has 10 questions in your head that you just know to ask or that you want answers to. And they're probably not written down anywhere. Uh, they're probably not in any procedure, but just based on your experience, you want to know the answer to these 10 things. And then you probably have to call somebody else and that somebody else probably has 10 of their own questions that need to be answered. If you start there, because you need those questions answered and the situational awareness program should be designed to answer those questions. 
But if you haven't explored those questions, fleshed them out, sat down and had and turned those into operational and then ultimately technical requirements, there's no way for the sources, the web map, the apps to be built to help you answer those questions. Um, too often, the technologists are guessing at what you need answered and you don't know what the technologist can do. You don't know all the capabilities of the platform. It's not your job. So that's the beginning place is just write down what your questions are. And if I remember, Chris, that was the first product the working group decided to produce was the, top, the kind of the David Letterman, right? The top 10 questions. And they got agreement on that. That's not a surprise. And I, that, was a, that was a big step because we, we started with electric, but it's very soon telecom and fuel and others came in. They are all looking for the same kind of thing. And it was amazing how quick the technologists could, oh, okay, that's what you want. And boom, they can produce it. I think what happens a lot of times is, hey, look at this. You don't like that? Hey, look at this. Hey, I got this. Hey, I can do that. Blah, blah, blah. And after six of those operators go, I don't have time for this. And it's unfortunate. And I think that's what the methodology that we're trying to propose here, and we will train in depth. That methodology is really key because the technologists want to do it and do it quickly and be recognized for that and work with better data, but they need guidance. And that's where the operations people, I think, have an important role. They may not understand how important it is, but the roadmap, I think, was the big thing missing. And that's what I think. Yes. And one last thing, we don't want to belabor this point too much, but it is the critical point, is also through that process, you may under, you may find out that you don't have the data to answer the question. Um, and that's why we have this programmatic approach across the bottom, because sometimes getting the data needs to be its own project. So that um, if, if you have a question that says, I need a specific, I need to answer a specific question about a specific thing, and, the, and that data about that thing is not available or it's locked up in some system inside of your company or inside of the, your government agency, then you need to start a program that supports your situational awareness program to unlock that data and make it available, get it into a right format or collect it or whatever it is. So now you can start to manage these, these supportive projects to, to get the right data available to the, to, as a source here to answer the question. So it's, it's how it all comes together and everything can work synergistically and, and too often we have these stovepipes of excellence um, instead of it all working together. So that's kind of how it works. So now I'm gonna show you just a couple uh, examples of kind of as Tom mentioned, uh, things that have been built to answer folks' questions. So this is the, the kind of the eye candy. Um, for example, uh, this one, I don't wanna know about all the facilities. I just wanna know the ones that are gonna be impacted within this storm's air cone. That's the question. What do I have infrastructure wise that's gonna be impacted by this exact storm? So you see here, facilities within the error cone. This is the same operations dashboard uh, tool that, that Carrie just built for you in real time. Um, but this one is using what's called a spatial filter. So it's filtering what's inside that cone. And then you can see the short-term watches and warnings that are right here. So they know that is there a facility that's in imminent danger of a tornado warning, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and Carrie, jump in here anytime to help mm -hmm. me out. Uh, Carrie, you take this one. Yeah. yeah, so this is a new uh, feature available. And so this is storm surge prediction, um, very timely with the hurricanes that we've been having. Um, but basically the example here was hospitals in the surge. So if you come over here, um, all of the area in red is showing greater than nine feet above ground will be the surge. And you can see that two hospitals could potentially be affected by that. Um, and then down through, um, orange would be greater than six feet, yellow is greater than three, blue is greater than one, and so on and so forth. So take out hospitals and put in whatever is important to you, um, you know, infrastructure or lines or buildings or whatever that means, um, same sort of information um, that you can start to look at from the storm surge predictability. 
So this, this is now a new product coming from the National Hurricane Center. They start putting these out for any storm, uh, tropical storm making landfall on the continental United States about 72 hours ahead of time. And what you're seeing behind the scenes is, uh, it, and we'll talk about a system of analytics here in a second, is it, an analysis that basically the, the GIS says, how many of these things do I have in, in which, which color area and giving you that here. So there is analytics beneath it which is what allows data to become information. So if you're if you have coastal infrastructure, this may be something that you would be interested in in doing. Um, Carrie, you yeah, I'll take this one. So this was from um, Hurricane Zeta. So this is a fairly recent um, uh, screenshot that we have here for you today. Um, but basically this is nationwide power outages. And so you can actually see the path that Zeta took um, right there. Chris is, is um, showing that with his cursor. And oh yeah, there's something going on in Oklahoma too. And so that was the ice storm that Oklahoma was having. And so you can actually filter this dashboard by state all the way down to county level, see how many power outages are out, how many customers are affected. Um, and you can also see a three hour trend as well as the last um, five minutes, whether it's trending up or trending down. And you can see here um, at this particular time, there were over 3 million power outages in the nation. So this is again, using data, uh, um, but also pretty, uh, the analytics of the GIS platform behind the scenes to turn that into information, answering a specific question, which is how many people are out of power and where? Um, so, uh, and it's kind of interesting. You can actually track, follow the storm path or extrapolate the storm path just by following the power outages. This one's definitely you, Carrie. <laughs> um, so what we're showing here is um, fleet movement app. Um, so this is important to probably some of you on the phone. Um, on the webinar. Um, basically, as fleets are moving to help, um, for example, down south, you know, coming from the north, traveling down south, um, you're interested in facilities, hotels, gas stations, big box stores, pharmacies. But in addition, this year, we have COVID to deal with. So um, there's an application that we built um, that shows just the COVID counties and the trending rate. So the red is higher cases of COVID. The light colors um, like yellow and, and ivory are lower incidences of, of COVID. And so the idea is as crews are traveling, um, they can see, hey, I may want to stop here or eh, I may want to travel a little bit further down the road. Um, so one nice thing is this works on anything. Um, so if a person has this on their phone in their truck and they're traveling down through, they can actually see what facilities and things are closest to them, what county they're driving in and what the incidence of COVID is looking like right then and there in real time. They can also search for things that are near them and get turn by turn driving directions. So there's a lot put into this. Um, that helps to answer questions, but also gives you push notifications and gives you information back. But, but just let me make a comment real quick on this one, Carrie. There is a, we have a, our multi-state fleet response working group has been working the mutual aid issue since um, 2013. So this is a great example of people uh, predominantly, predominantly electric in the beginning, but now it's eight or nine sectors working the problem, defining what it was, what the impacts were and what was needed. Uh, and you, you can't imagine the data that's out there that most people don't know about. And so by, by having the problem clearly defined, Carrie, Chris would, would be listening in. I mean, this group meets every Friday and they zeroed in on this, I think, what was the first storm we did, Sally? Carrie, I think it was Sally, right? It was Laura, Laura. Laura, okay. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Esri came out with something new and literally in a week, Chris and Carrie had pulled this up and the electric sector folks said, holy moly, look at that. And very simply, it allowed them to pick a route and then the technology would provide the data along the route that would be threat data, which is COVID, but it could be riots, it could be anything. Um, as well as resource data, food, fuel, parking, staging, generators, PPE suppliers, it's endless. 
But it, what made it work was the people agreed that here's the requirement. You agree, you agree, yep, yep, we're all on board, and boom. It, it didn't take long to do the technology part. What took the time was the process of getting everybody to agree and then having the technology that wouldn't load all 2.8 million data sets in one map. And, and, and Esri provides that, which is great. Um, but I think this is a great, great example of what can be done when you have the people, the process, and the technology all coordinated. That, that was point. That was the point. And Tom, you bring a good point that we haven't um, we haven't actually touched on enough, which is the the difference between a viewer and a GIS is analytics. Um, a, a viewer will let you view data, and you'll end up with a lot of dots on a map, and that's fine if that's what you need. But if you want to do analytics, such as the COVID cases along a, a, a route or the resources along a route, analytics is an automation of a procedure. So without understanding the desired procedure, the desired process, the analytics can't function. So this is again, why it's so important to understand the question you're trying to answer and the standard operating procedure behind that because we're automating those things and only uh, it's also as equally important to train people on that because you've now automated a procedure and everybody better, better understand what the procedure is because it's now automated. So this is one that's got a lot of automation built into it. And as Tom said, it was, a, it was the result of a lot of conversations. So everybody completely understood what they, what they wanted. Uh, and, and we completely understood what needed to be built. All right. Uh, a couple more. Um, this is a, a, cl a close up of that. The big difference here is this is actually also doing live tracking of folks uh, using a, a, an applet called Tracker. So take that previous workflow and then add where you can live track where your people are uh, as they proceed along that route. And you can provide them either remote support, uh, such as, hey, you're, here's a, there's a, hotel nearby um, or you move to the next county because it's you're in an epidemic county and you need to move to a lower um, COVID rate county. But uh, this is something that runs on your mobile and it provides live tracking uh, of your location, speed, all those kind of things. Uh, yeah, Chris, Chris, one point on that too, that word tracking might scare some of you, right? I don't want to be tracked. But there's a flip side to that too. If I have the app and I turn it on, now all the data relevant to my position comes to me. So it isn't, we don't necessarily care where the vehicle is. Some, some of you do, but if I'm a driver, I want to know, is there an accident 50 miles up front? Is there a flood going on? Am I coming into a hot zone? So the, the, it's a trade, right? You, you've got to trade what you want and, and the balance there. And tracking is the smallest part of the solution here. I think from the driver's standpoint, when I turn that on, it now gives me the ability to bring all that data within the sites or whatever the system is to me so I can see it real time. Very unique. But again, the price to pay for that is while, I'm, while the app is on, people can track where I'm going and I turn it off and it stops tracking. So we've answered a lot of questions on that. Because some people's heart stops when you say tracking your vehicles. To some, it's not a big deal. To some, it's a really big deal. So that's, that's part of the people part is right. working through the trade. Very, very true. Very, very true. Um, safety and security. Um, this is uh, uh, around a this is around a school, but it can also be other types of facilities. What's happening near something that I care about? Um, and this application is pulling in a combination of. Well, the question that he answered it that was asked was, I need to know whenever there's these types of things happening near a school that I care about. <clears throat> now, this could be a school, it could be a government building, it could be a piece of critical infrastructure, it could be anything. Um, but in this case, they wanted to know, are these types of things happening? So using a combination of, of uh, data being derived from social media and other kinds of sources, as well as a field application where people can report. I, I saw, I hear gunshots, or I saw graffiti, or I see a fire, and they report that through a very simple uh, phone application. Um, the people inside of this facility know what's going on and how far away. You can see there's a couple rings here, range rings around the facility. So if you have one facility or 100 facilities, the same thing could be applied. Um, and because of the uh, analytics behind this, the question also was, and I need to be notified. 
So anytime if there's an active shooter within one mile of the school or graffiti in this case, they get an email pushed to them. So uh, you don't have to always be watching the screen to know that something new is happening. This is another way you use GIS for situational awareness. In this case, the situational awareness is what is happening near something I care about. Uh, I think we only have a couple more. I'm keeping an eye on the time. I want to leave some time for questions. Situational awareness is not just about stuff. It's also about your money. So uh, another kind of different way of looking at this is how do I how do I use this to manage where my grants are going and their performance or my projects are being funded and their performance plan versus actuals, um, those kind of things. And this is a same tool that Carrie built, but instead of it being a wet live weather or something, it's money. Um, and, and if you're an emergency management agency, you know, you know that you do this every day. So how do I know, are my recovery programs on track or are my mitigation programs on track? You can, that's, that's situational awareness also, program management. Last but not least, so what have we been talking about? So this is the only kind of technical slide that I, that I wanted to get into. And that is, we actually have been talking about um, three different types of systems. The dashboard systems that you saw Carrie build is your app maps and apps. This is what we call a system of engagement. And this is a derivative of an Esri slide. So full credit to them. Um, your system of engagement provides identification, understanding, context. So like the, the chlorine spill example, where are things happening in relative to other things? Uh, has to support your plans and procedures and is tailored to your role and responsibility. That's that user defined picture. But this is just the viewing part. What, where the real magic happens is these other two. You have a system of record. If you're in a crisis, if you're in a government agency, you probably have a web EOC. You probably have some other sort of crisis management system that is your system of record. It may have legal reasons that you have that, like records retention. Um, it, it's your data input tool. It's how people request assistance. You know, you have very specific reasons why you have that system of record. If you're in a private company like a utility, you probably have an outage management system. You probably have a resource uh, management system and multiple tools. Those are systems of record. The system of engagement ties into those things real time. Um, pulls data right out of these. And you, we've pulled data out of WebEOC. We've pulled data out of things like ROD. Um, it just it allows you to visualize what's in the system of record instead of looking at a text-based screen. And the, the most important thing in situational awareness is this piece in the middle. This is the system of insight or analytics. And this is what allows you to do those context things. What is COVID like along my route? What is happening near my facility? Uh, what infrastructure do I have inside the error cone? So if you think about that last one, Here's where your infrastructure is. Here's the wet, where you ask the question, what's within the air cone of the storm? And here's where you view it. So these three things work together to provide you the tool that becomes your situational awareness platform. And it's only by managing these three in the context of answering specific operator driven questions that all of this works um, and it has to be sustained through training, standard operating procedures, and display plans. You, mo many of you already have access to these tools, and many of you aren't using them to their full potential. And the reason is because it's that human part that Tom was talking about that's really hard, and that connection between the operators and the technologists who can use all these things to get your questions answered and field a, a truly effective, comprehensive situational awareness program. So with that, Laura, I'll turn it back over to you. We have a couple of minutes for questions and, uh, and wrap up. All right, Chris, thank you so much. Get back to the slideshow. All right. Okay, so I'd like to thank um, Chris and Carrie. Can you see my slideshow okay, guys? Thumbs up? Yep. Okay, great. Um, if you would like to get in touch uh, with Chris or Carrie, I put, went ahead and put their email addresses on the screen. Um, thank you so much for your presentation today. I uh, wanted to just turn it back over to Tom um, before we move on to some Q&A. So Tom? Great, thank you. Um, what, 
what um, what I think it's important everybody understands is the people part of this is really what makes the technology is out there. There's many different kinds um, and, it, and there's many different systems. I, I saw Joe Ritchie was on. Joe, you have a customized water works kind of software platform. It's kind of what's feeding things like that. So uh, the whole reason the site was set up is to kind of be a, a crowdsourced uh, place where we could set standards on reliability. We could aggregate data. We could get federal, state, local, and commercial degree on the reliability of a certain data source many different things. So that's part of the site. So I would, I would encourage you all, if you want to get more information on the process and do this, uh, you can do that at SiteUSA.org. Um, we have some questions, Laura, on this. I'll, I will answer during the question phase. So uh, great stuff. And um, it's all about, it, it comes down to the use case. What are we trying to solve? And that's all the decision makers want. And what we found is once the decision makers could agree on what they want, the technologists could come to life. It's really amazing how fast it can work. So it's bridging that gap. I hope you take away today. We'll get into deeper stuff later on this. But anyway, thank you for joining. We're going to now get into some questions, I hope. Yeah, actually, Tom, while you still are unmuted, one of the questions was about the Fleet Management Working Group and how someone can get involved. Yeah, so the Fleet Response Working Group is one of the working groups of the consortium. Um, it is... Um, it, it's, it's operational. It, it's it's year-round planning. Um, I'll put in the chat. Um, you have to be a member of the consortium for 27 bucks a year. You can become a member and you can get access to the basic version of the fleet app. But now you can be involved in some of the discussion process that we have here. So um, the reason we have a price to that is we vet people within the sites. Everybody is vetted. So we use the credit card transaction as one of those ways to vet information. So the people that own the data know the people looking at the data are vetted. We know who you are. You're not a imposter, we've got an email, we've got a cell, we've got a credit card transaction. That's how the private sector wants to do. They want to know who's looking at their data and for what purpose. And so that's what the site's framework is about. Um, but this is just one of many apps that Carrie and Chris and others have, have been working on and there's more to come. So um, hopefully that answers your question. You, I'll put it in the chat. You can go to ahcusa.org, hit join us and you can, um, it takes three minutes, so it doesn't take long. All right, Tom, thank you so much. Um, and as you can see on your screen, if you have a question, please go ahead and use the Q&A. Um, and I'll go ahead and read that to our panelists today. Uh, Chris and Carrie, we do have a question. How does someone get started with these tools? So the, the first step is um, awareness. And there's two different ways of doing that. One would be um, you, can, you can take some initial training to play around with it. One of the reasons we wanted to have Carrie build an app on this uh, on this webinar was so that you folks would see kind of the basic steps uh, technically. Um, so that's, that's one way to get started. Um, there is some training that you can take that's online uh, to, with the basics kind of GIS 101. But what's really important is, is getting with, if you have GIS people or if you have technology people in your organization and you're an operator, seek them out and just sit down with them and just start communicating with them and get to know what they can do and let them know what you need and begin the dialogue. Because without the dialogue, um, it's just not, uh, you're, 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 you're missing out on the opportunity. Yeah, and talk, talk to them. Chris, I, I think another thing you zeroed in on is what are the top 10 questions on your mind? Write those down. Um, with, without those clearly done, it's just round and round and round. And we see it all the time, right? It's like two different worlds trying to come together. Um, and it's hard. So uh, if you operators can write down, what are the top 10 questions that always come up in every incident? Fire, flooding, landslide, tornado, hurricane, doesn't matter. You can find the top three or four all the time. And if you can get the top 10 down, not just from you and the operations, but ask finance, ask HR, right? Ask your executives, what do they want to know? Then you can go to your technical folks and they will, they will come to life. It's amazing, right? They want to create. It's a very creative business, right? At least they're creating something that, you, that matters to you as the operators, right? And without you telling them, you're wasting your time in theirs. But if you will write it down, you're, you're now aligning their energy to your need. And when they come to you with a product or a screen, you're going to know it's tied to your question three and you're going to zero in versus trying to digest all the GIS stuff. 
I don't know, but I don't know, but you know, I tell Chris all the time, after looking at three maps, I'm done, right? But if he tells me, hey, Tom, map two solves your question about PPE, I'm like, okay, I'm all in. See how it works, right? right. right. Um, Chris or Carrie, um, you talked about how to deploy the tools, but what are some of the mistakes that you see in organizations that are just getting started? Um, the, the biggest, the biggest one is the lack of communication between the operators and the GIS, the technologists. That's that's number one. Number two is not investing enough in making sure that your team is kept up to date on the technology. Too many the, when it's software as a service, uh, new new capabilities come out quarterly, monthly even. And if you're not investing or allowing your team to go to go to conferences and attend training. Uh, you're falling behind it really quickly. Um, and the third one I have is if you're an operator, not seeking out other examples uh, and seeing the art of the possible from other places. I know, Carrie, you have anything you want to add to that? Carrie, you've been on the inside of this one. No, I think communication and just understanding what those questions are that are being asked. I mean, you can't build something to answer a question without knowing what's up front. And communication is huge. You know, um, you work with lots of different people who all want different answers. Most times one place can start that and each person can then use it and work with it in a different manner. All right, Chris, and you talked about uh, training. So I uh, wanted to let our listeners know today that the All Hazards Consortium is working with Chris and Carrie to come up with a training workshop on this very thing. It'll be four hours uh, planning for early spring. Um, you'll see on some on the screen some um, of a go our goals as we put this together. Uh, we'd also want to hear from you um, if you have any ideas of what you'd like to see um, during such a virtual training. So reach out to us. I'm going to share my email um, at the end of this presentation. And um, also next week, uh, for those of you who know, we do these events regularly. We have state BEOC programs, lessons learned from COVID-19 from a team from Illinois. That's on the 19th at four o'clock. We will send you an invitation to that. It's, there's no charge. Um, and then the All Hazard Consortium is also working on our big annual event, our Resil Resilience Exchange Summit, which will be January 26th through the 28th, virtually half days from about 1230 to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you'll see that they'll, we'll have strategies, um, some high level strategies on day one will be done in plenary. Day two, we'll have some breakouts and some mix of plenary sessions that we'll talk about initiatives and projects dealing with resiliency. And then day three will be a roll up your sleeves training, uh, breakouts, small group discussion, training and education for some solutions, innovations and research. So we just opened our, our website for that this week. So feel free to check that out. And, then, and this is really a culmination of all of the virtual webinars we've been doing since the summer um, and taking it to the next step. All right, so as promised, here's my email address, laura.johnson at ahcusa.org. Feel free to email me at any time if you have any questions. Um, and in the meantime, I'd like to thank Carrie, Tom, Chris for being here today for this webinar. Um, and to thanks, thanks to all of you for attending. We hope that you found it informative and helpful. And that's all we have today. Stay safe, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody.